Hello, and welcome to another episode of KC in Conversation, uh, coming to you from Dublin, Ireland. KC in Conversation is an occasional series of discussions and conversations with interesting people uh, where I talk to them about who they are and what they think about politics and ethics and history, and indeed, uh, we'll follow the conversation wherever it goes. My guest today is Patrick Tracy. Patrick, very welcome to the program. Thank you. Okay. Patrick is a barrister, a senior counsel. I distinguished one. He didn't want me to say that, but I've said it now. Okay. <laughs> and also, uh, interesting, uh, the, the, I, I don't want to give the impression that barristers are to a penny, but there are lots of them, and the, the uh, profession of barrister is perfectly respectable. He also has, if you like, another string to his bow uh, in terms of a, I don't quite know what to call it, an institute or a... Well, we call it a domestic centre. A, a domestic centre yeah, yeah. called Integritas, um, which I find very fascinating. So this conversation, to some extent, is to explore um, how he got to where he is. And so we're going to begin from there. Is that OK? So Patrick, who are you? This is the question. I mean, where do you come from? Uh, what was your background? Yeah, so well, I'm 50 years of age. I was 50 in July this year. I know that. And, <laughs> I was uh, at your birthday party. <laughs> yes. And um, so I originally come from Nina and Tipperary. All right. So my parents are both alive. They live there. Yeah. And then uh, I live outside Kilkenny. So I mean, did you, you went to school in oh, sorry, yes. Nina, yeah. So I went to school in Nina. I went to the Christian Brothers. Uh, I, I was educated by the Christian Brothers, I hope. <laughs> and um, I have great affection for them, actually. Yeah. Uh, my father was educated by the Christian Brothers, and my grandfather was. So there's an old affection there. And, um, and then when I left, um, I went to UCD then to study law. When was that? That was in 1986. Oh, I, I just came at that year. Yeah, I completely stayed away from the philosophy department. You, were, you did the right thing. <laughs> how, how wise you were. <laughs> um, so I did law in UCD until 1989, and then I did two years in the King's Inns, and then I did a year in University College in London doing a master's. Oh, did you? Yes. And then uh, I'm surprised that you're so surprised. And then, <laughs> and then I, uh, after that, then I came back and I started practicing at the Irish Bar. Okay, very good. And you took silk when? when, when? That was in 2011. So okay. I, I practiced as a junior counsel for about 19 years, All and right. then I became a senior uh, eight years ago. All right, very good. Excellent. And what would be your area of specialty if you, you had one? Uh, um, uh, tort, personal injury law, uh, medical negligence medical. law, and uh, crime. Oh, okay, great. Not, not uh, personally, okay. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> and so, okay, that's, so, so that's great. Um, were you all, in other words, was it a given? Because I, 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 I think your father was in the legal profession, That's is that right. correct? He's a, he's a solicitor, right. yeah. He is indeed. So was it, was it a sort of um, a matter of destiny that you were going to go into the legal profession in some form or another, or was that uh, something that happened? Yeah, well, you see, um, 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 where I grew up, my father uh, was, was a solicitor, still a solicitor, actually, he's 87 years mm. of age, and he <laughs> was the state solicitor for North Tipperary for about, I think, 17 years. Mm. So the family home where I grew up uh, had a solicitor's practice in the home as well. And it's an interesting right. thing that because I always, I suppose from my upbringing, I always kind of learned that a family home can be more than simply what we conventionally understand a family home to be. Mm. So uh, when I was growing up then, there was always a sense of, 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 you know, what a solicitor's practice entails and legal practice was kind of, you know, I was marinated in that, so to speak, <laughs> when I was growing up. I like and, that. Um, <laughs> and occasionally then when the circuit court would be in our town, barristers would come down to our home. Our, yep. My father would often talk about briefing different barristers. So it kind of interested me uh, as a teenager, really, what, what a barrister is, you know, mm. what a barrister does. But what was uh, unsettling for me was that when I started practice as a barrister, after about a year of practice, I was about 20, I think I started when I was 23. So when mm. I was about 24, having done a year of it, I started to become disillusioned with it. <laughs> and then after... That's slightly problematic. <laughs> that is problematic. <laughs> and then after two years, I was very seriously disillusioned with it. And uh, so then I... Um, and that was interesting, I suppose, we're looking back in retrospect, because of course, yeah. in retrospect, you can kind of rationalize what happened, but you're, you don't actually, you yeah. can't appropriate it at the time. Mm. So what was happening was that um, I suppose I, I, I kind of came to, I was going through a phase of kind of realizing that I had things the wrong way around, so to speak, in that, um, and this is going to be a fundamental theme all the way along, what, what I mean by having things the wrong way around is that 
I, I kind of started my career thinking this was something I was going to do, and I was going to earn my own worth and earn my own status in life. And then I had a realization in my mid-twenties that that's a completely wrong and, and false way of thinking, you know? So I, I went through, I suppose, a spiritual crisis, really, in my mid-twenties, mm. and, uh, and I had to stop practice. And then I spent some time in India, and then I spent some time with the Jesuits in Ireland, and in particular in the United States. And then I was actually considering religious life, actually oh, becoming see. a Jesuit. Yeah. Um, and, um, but funnily enough, when I was really considering that seriously, I, I felt unease and restlessness about that as well. So, <laughs> so um, yeah. th that's really where this whole idea of having a domestic center of Christian spirituality comes from. It's really, it comes from seeking to integrate the calling our desire to be married and to be a father and to have children mm -hmm. uh, with the desire to also live out an explicitly religious and spiritual life. And that's, and it's, it's kind of holding those two, or being held by those two in tandem has always been the kind of, the, the challenge. Did you spend long with the, uh, with the Jesuits? Not really, no, I didn't. Yeah. I was with them for quite a short time, but I suppose I've been, what happened was I became very friendly with a Jesuit in Dublin called Peter Hannan. Mm. So I kind of think I went through kind of three, there were kind of three critical moments. I think when I was about 24, 25, I remember I was on an eight-day retreat at that time down in Wicklow, and I had a very uh, strong and disturbing experience, I think, in that, where I had this kind of sense that I have things oriented the wrong way, you know? Uh, and, you know, in other words, the, the way I had things oriented at that time was I was, you know, ambitious and a, a young man, and I wanted to establish a career, and I had a, a word I heard you use before, I had an avocation <laughs> around spiritual matters as a yeah. kind of a side interest. Yeah. Yeah. And when I went on that retreat in my mid-twenties, uh, what was disturbing for me was I realized no, that, that spiritual matters and the spiritual life is the center, mm. and your career or your calling or all these things are peripheral to actually being a witness to the Christian vision in the world. Mm. So that was, the, that was the, the first kind of key moment. Um, but the second thing then was when I got associated with the Jesuits, and in particular when I became very, very close to a, a Jesuit who is still alive and strong and well called Peter right. Hannon, was that I realized I had a false understanding of Christianity as well, <laughs> which is, which is yeah. quite problematic. Yeah. Um, um, and in particular when I went to India, I think that kind of really brought home to me that false understanding. And what, what the false understanding was really was that I had a very relativized understanding of Christianity. So I kind of saw, if you take a wheel, I kind of saw all of the world's religions as different spokes on a wheel leading to, to, to God. But <clears throat> I think through my friendship with Peter Hannon, I realized that the Christian claim is a very different claim to that. The Christian claim is that Jesus is the center of the wheel. Mm. And, um, and once that happened, it's amazing how clarity started to arrive then, when, once I started to get a true understanding of what Christianity actually claims, which is that Jesus can't be relativized, and that Jesus as God is center. And, and once I began to realize at an interior level that the relationship with him is the anchor and the center of my whole life, then that was a key moment. Uh, mm. And uh, that came, all these experiences come through eight day retreats, so that, that became clear. <laughs> I'm glad you've warned me. <laughs> yes, so that became, that happened on another eight day yeah. retreat when I was maybe 26 or 27 or 28. And, um, and then the third real kind of realization was actually the day I got married. So, um, right. because the day I got married really, there was a great sense of resolution the day I got married. You know, that this, this unease and disquiet and struggle in a way, ended on the day I got married, you know? Um, I had a sense, I suppose that when I reflect back on the day I got married, I, ha I had a really strong sense of, in, in marrying my wife, whose name is Linda, I had a very strong sense of Christ's presence through our relationship very mm. clearly on the day we got married. So they were, they were different experiences that were p pivotal, like in my own development. Yes, I, th I think it would be fair to say in much sort of ordinary Catholic thinking, um, <clears throat> there is, a, if you like, a supposition that there are sort of two, there's a two-tier way of living the Christian life. There's the 
serious one, or I mean the fully committed one, which means you become a priest or you join a religious order and mm. so on. And then there is the kind of slightly <laughs> less central, but sort of the second class one, mm. when, when, which is your layman or woman, and you kind of live your life out. And of course, one of the uh, one of the axes that the reformers had to grind was, in fact, an attack on this. And there's two ways you can you can get rid of that duality. One is by leveling down. In other words, making mm. the, in other words, getting rid of the religious life and so on, and, and sort of making everybody, as it were, laymen and lay women. And the other is to try and bring laymen and lay women up to the calling, if you like, that's felt particularly uh, by those who, if you like, who make a commitment to live the, the life of chastity, poverty, and obedience, and so on. Mm. Um, and I think it's fair to say that there's sort of a permanent tension in the Catholic tradition between those two, which would seem, if I'm correct, would seem to be something that in your experience, as you've just described it, you felt, mm -hmm. right? And then your creation with your wife, Linda Rainsbury, of Integritas, to some extent, is an attempt to work out that mm -hmm. tension. Would that be correct? Oh, I think that's very true. Yeah. I mean, you see, I think what's helpful, too, is to, is to identify like, what is the center of concern of, of the Christian experience, mm -hmm. of the faith experience. And the center of concern, as we would see it, is, is to come to know that you're loved to come mm. to know that you're a creature of God, that you're created by God, that you're created out of love, that your being is not an accident, that it's, it's, it's willed by God. So, so the, the core is to, is to become a person who's able to receive love, <laughs> to receive love, to grow in the conviction of being loved. And when you grow in the conviction of being loved, then as night follows day, you become loving to other people. Mm. So, that was a, an area where Peter Hannon affected me very strongly, which was that I think before I met him, I was always seeing the Gospels as kind of didactic, that they were, that I, I saw them as four tracks of teaching. Mm. But what he really emphasized for me, you know, they're revelations of how Christ communicates love to people, the way he looks at people, the way he speaks to people, the way he interacts with people, are revelations of love. And what the Christian experience then is about is primarily it's about becoming a person who's receptive to being loved. And for that to happen, you've got to live and you've got to, you know, thrive in a context of being a, a recipient of love, of appreciating love, of being grateful for love, and of being in loving relationships. So what really was the challenge that when you talk about these two different mm -hmm. ways of, 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 of understanding of the Catholic life, is that a life of great virtue committed to you know, poverty, chastity, and obedience. The, the difficulty I found with that uh, was not at all that it lacked aspiration or nobility. The difficulty was, was that to actually receive love is not a priority in that particular view of Christian faith. Mm. You know, it is certainly a priority in that view of Christian faith to give love, to be selfless, to be self-sacrificial. But the more fundamental need we all have is to know that we are loved and to know we are loved by God. And that has to be communicated to us primarily through others. It's also communicated through prayer. But it has to be felt at the level of the heart through others. So that's why this whole idea of the family home as a place of Christian experience became so central in our thinking. Because the family is par excellence the place potentially where you can receive love and give love. And, and that's why it, it needs to be really rediscovered <coughs> as a place of Catholic and Christian experience. No, I, I find that really interesting. I think it, if we were to make some comparative judgments, I would think it would be fair to say that in Judaism, that's a sort of commonplace. Sorry, that's not to take anything away from it. In mm. other words, that the, the Jewish faith is lived uh, not just in the synagogue, but in and through the home, yeah, and so on. And but that wouldn't have been, and probably still isn't the case, uh, in if you like Catholic thinking. We tend to think of religion as being something we do on a Sunday, uh, if we're very holy and very pious, maybe occasionally during the week and so on. By and large, we tend to segregate it, okay, mm -hmm. from the family and not to regard. I mean, I mean, that's not to say that people in that e who even think like that, I mean, don't say their prayers and so on, mm. they do. But to think of the home itself as a focus for the development of the religious life mm. and for the development of the idea that, as you said, that, that, that not only is God loved, but that, that he loves us. And in a way, since God always loves us, no matter what we do, 
Okay, it doesn't mean he necessarily likes what we're doing and so on, but he always loves it. The real challenge is to persuade people to accept the gift that's been given. Because for many of us in our heart of hearts, we don't really think that we're lovable. Mm. Right? Now, there are lots of reasons for this. Many of them have to do with our upbringing uh, and in our own particular families, and many of them have to do with the broader kind of social context in which we find ourselves. Uh, and for men, I think particularly, I mean, the relationship with our father is absolutely essential. And mm. if that's imperfect, I mean, sort of, uh, not that any human relationship is, is in itself perfect, but if that is damaging to you, okay, especially given the notion that the primary image of God in Christianity is God the Father, which mm. we tend to forget, it's, if there is damage done to you, as it were, in that relationship, it can be very hard to believe that you're actually worthy of love, not because you're, you're wonderful and great, but because of God has actually created you and loved mm. you for no other reason than that he has actually made you to be that way. And that's mm. very hard to accept. Mm. Oh, yes. Well, yeah. I'm sorry to put that to you. I would put it, I'm going to be very uh, legal. I'm putting it to you that that's Okay, the case. well, that's good. Well, we know the format now. It took me a few minutes to get used to it. Um, well, there's a whole range of things that come up from what yeah. you say there. I mean, the, the, the first thing I just, I, I suppose, that strikes me is like, what are essential elements of the Christian spiritual life, you mm. know? And of course, like anyone would say, well, well prayer and reflection is a central mm. element, or theological study and reflection is a central mm. element. But what you don't commonly hear is that the capacity to receive and give love is a central element. Mm. In other words, the capacity to relate as a loving human being mm. is not kind of articulated as central. But actually, that is like I, I, I mean, I use the word for that relationality, for instance, mm. not a word I particularly like, but but it's a word I just use for that. That really is a non-negotiable in Christian experience: the capacity to receive and give love and. The family is a school in love and relationships, mm. and we need to learn that too. And of course, the way to learn that, the, the, the primary way to learn that <coughs> is the relationship between the child and the child's father and the child's mother. So, so that's, the, that's the potential of the ideal family, so to speak. Uh, and of course, that's an, I mean, every family is imperfect, but mm. there is an ideal. Yes, and the ideal yeah, yeah. is to receive love from your mother and your father. And that Absolutely. is that is an ideal. Yeah. There's no point in saying, you know, there are different forms of family that are all as good as, as each other. The ideal is to be known and loved by your own mother and father, mm. uh, which is always imperfect because human love is always imperfect. Mm. But the other thing that um, you've touched on there, which I think is a, an enormously important and relevant theme at the moment, is the loss of the father. Mm. Uh, and of course, if, 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 if your relationship with your, your, your historical biological father is damaged or weak, of course that's a block to the, mm. the, the Christian expression of the unconditional love of the father. Um, but um, but there's, a bigger, there's a bigger aspect to that though, which, which different writers are kind of focusing on now, which is that like, where, we're, where we really are now in Western civilization is that we were in a, 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 an anthropological, I wouldn't say crisis, I'd, er, people keep talking about this crisis, mm. that, it's not so much an, a, a crisis, but there's a major anthropological misunderstanding, which I think we're kind of getting to the core of now, which is that our whole nature as created beings, as, as, as made in the image and likeness of God, uh, is fundamentally under attack. So in other words, we, we have become completely engrossed with creating our own reality, creating ourselves, mm. believing we create ourselves, and not understanding that we are, that our life is a gift that we have received, that we come from a heritage, that we have a, a whole tradition from our own family that we have received and has been given to us. And the erasure of the father is an act of forgetfulness. It's an act of erasure of memory, of remembrance, of your ancestry, of where you come from, mm. of where you get your name and your tradition and your whole genetic heritage uh, and cultural understanding from. So <clears throat> this is a huge problem because, you know, particularly with the advent of social media and what uh, Pope Francis calls the technocratic paradigm, mm. young people now have are, are sold this idea that they create themselves, they create their own mm. reality, and they create their own identity. And an idea that I'm kind of playing around with at the moment and just reading a small bit about is 
the correlation between the breakdown of the family and in particular the breakdown of the importance of the father with the rise of identity politics. Yes. They have to be connected, hmm. you know? So, yeah. so, that, so you, there's a lot of things you're bringing up there, you know? Yeah, th there are. I want to go back to actually to the point you made um, about relate the centrality of relationality yes. as the core of the Christian life. And I, I'm going to relate very briefly a, an experience I myself had many, many years ago um, when I hadn't been long in UCD, I was in a room marking examination scripts, and there is nothing more boring than marking <laughs> examination scripts. And there was, a per another, there was a graduate student in the room with me who was doing the same thing. And needless to say, of course, after some time, we, instead of getting on with the job, we started to talk. And she started, I don't know how, quite how the conversation turned to religion, but it did. And I started to make the point, uh, among others, uh, not as crassly as I'm going to make it now, but it sort of came up in the conversation that essentially, you know, Catholicism and Christianity generally isn't, isn't an ethic. It's not primarily a, f a form of ethics. It's not that ethics is unimportant, but that's not what it's about. And it's not a series of rules <laughs> by and large. And I, I said, well, you know, really, the, it's, it has to do with developing a relationship between you and God, and especially in the context of Christianity, between the second person of the Trinity, which is Jesus, who came mm -hmm. among us and adopted our nature. And once that's central, then the other stuff falls into place. In other words, the reason you, you have rules is that the same reason you have sort of warning signs in areas. So, I mean, if you go to the Cliffs of Moher, I'm sure there's probably a sign up there saying, don't go beyond this point, you're likely to fall off. Mm. So, when you, you know, so we have the Ten Commandments, or as people now talk about the Ten Hints or Suggestions, um, which is, you know, don't kill. Mm. If you go around killing other people, it's really not conducive to the, the development of your spiritual life or your love mm. of God. Don't steal other people's stuff. Get your own donkey. Mm. Okay. Um, and, and that, if you like, that's not, the first, that's not the first thing you see. That's something, once you've grasped w what you're... No, which emerges from a relationship. When you understand that, those things follow. Just as, and I think here the parallel is strong uh, to come back to the human level. I mean, if, if people who are listening to us can remember the first flush of romantic enthusiasm they might have had when they met their life partner, mm. when he or she seems to be sort of all in all and perfect. That doesn't last very long, by the way, but that's another story. But, but during that period of infatuation, most of us are afflicted with a desire to do what our beloved wants, mm. whatever will please our beloved. And of course, Augustine says similar, something similar. He says, love and do what you will, which seems like radically kind of liberal <laughs> and liberalized, mm. that if you love God, then you want to do what God wills. So therefore, mm. you're, you're moving your will into an identity with God, and therefore you will, you will do all of these things, not against the current of your nature, but there's a kind of a second nature coming from yourself. Mm. But the core of it is relationality, and that's the thing. Now, what was interesting about that is that my interlocutor thought that this was some sort of bright idea that I'd come up with by myself. And I was immensely flattered by this, and I had to kind of say, well, really, this isn't my invention. Mm. This is actually what Christianity and Catholicism is actually about, mm. okay? The, the sort of common conception of it as a series of rules that must be observed by a very stern God that's going to smack you around the head if you fail your examination is actually a caricature mm. and not what we're talking about. Mm. So I thought that was, it was kind of interesting that mm. this was the conception we were, we were getting at. So that's mm. just, by the way, to... Yeah, just as, again, there's, there's a few things that strike me about that. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why the pontificate of Pope Francis is... I mean, I find it enthralling, and I'm a huge uh, admirer of him. Um, and one of the reasons is it's the way he relates to people. You see, he's, he, there's a style in relating. And it's interesting, John O'Malley's book on the Second Vatican Council, he makes this point that we tend to look back in the Second Vatican Council and we say, yes, it was about the resourcement or returning to the origins mm. of, of Christian and Catholic faith. It was about collegiality. Mm. But it was also about a third thing. And the third thing was the way the faith is related or communicated and the way we relate to each other. Mm. And this is a really important feature of this pontificate, like this, this emphasis on how we relate. And what we also forget, and we see it you know, in, in, in the Gospel of John, and we see it in chapter 15 of John, is that when Jesus says to the, to the disciples, I no longer call you master servant, I call you my friends, that, that like friendship is the culmination of, of the receiving and the giving of love. And, mm -hmm. And you mentioned a few moments ago about infatuation or falling mm. in love. 
it's very different. Like a friendship is very different to a romantic yes. relationship yeah. because a friendship is something, you know, the falling in love experience happens to you. That's right. A friendship is something you're very deliberate about. Like you, you make a deliberate, uh, you take deliberate steps to cultivate a friendship with somebody. Mm. And what's very different, of course, to a friendship between a friendship and a family member is that, you know, when there's no love between two family members, there's still a historical oh, kinship and yeah. a genetic connection. Yeah. But if there's no love between two friends, there's no friendship. <laughs> That's you know? right. So, yeah. so yeah. it's very pure, you know. Mm. And and what I find interesting is that you you do see a, a, a rising at the moment in Christian literature a re-emphasis on friendship again, um, coming through, which of course. You know, it goes right back to Aquinas wrote, wrote so beautifully about about friendship, but um, but I I certainly find now that I'm fifty, um, I'm still very young compared to you. But, I know, but, but, yeah. but um, I was hoping you wouldn't say that. No, but I do find that that um, you know I do find that the importance of cultivating and caring and being very deliberate about a circle mm. of friends is fiercely important. I mean, you know that wonderful line by Hilaire Belloc where. It said that there's nothing so worth the winning as laughter and the love of friends. Ah, yeah. You know, and it's really true that, that this is what really makes us happy. This is the dream inside all of us to have loving relationships in our lives. So, can I can I come back? See, so we've been talking about love, and one of the problems with the English language is we just have one word, mm -hmm. love, and it. So we say things like, "I love pizza." Mm. Okay. Or, I love my dog, or if you're remarkably sort of laid back, I love my wife, mm. right? Now, it's very hard to think that you mean exactly the same sort of thing <laughs> in all those, th in those three cases. And the classical language is Greek particularly, but even in Latin, you would have, for example, of eros, which would be the erotic mm. form of love, mm. the attachment between the man and the woman. Uh, you would have a mikitsia, which is friendship, okay? And you would have caritas, which is the Latin translation or the Latin word for agape, which mm. is the disinterested desire f for the good of another without any concern for yourself in that sort of relationship. Mm -hmm. So can I put those to you maybe as a way, as a, a linguistic sort of tool for exploring what you mean by love? Because we've, just, just, we've been talking about love mm. as such. So, for example, when... When one, this is, this, when I put this question to you, by the way, this is not a sort of rhetorical question that I'm doing just for the sake of the conversation. Mm. This is a real question I have. What kind of love can one have for God? Mm. If those are the possibilities. It's, is it eros? Is it amicitia? Is it a form of friendship? Mm. Or is it a form of caritas? Or is it something uniquely different? Oh, that's a fascinating question. When somebody says a question is fascinating, they're just buying time. <laughs> yeah, I know that. Answer, yeah. you know. I'm glad you asked me that um, question. Can, yeah, can, and I don't want to deflect from it. Can, I do, can we just unpack that just for yeah. a minute, though? Mm. Because there's something I just want to say about love. You see, love, the, 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 the use of the word love or to say that you love somebody is extraordinarily powerful. And incidentally, even though it's not politically correct to say this in, in Western society, when a man says that he loves somebody, it's very different to a woman saying that she loves somebody. In other words, if a woman says that she loves somebody, it doesn't carry the same nuclear kind of meaning <laughs> as when a man says it. So, for instance, I would have, I'm, I'm enormously fortunate to have some very close female friends in my life, and they would say to me that they would love me, mm. which, is a, which I just thrill to hear, you know. But I would never say to them that I love mm. them, even though I do know I love them, mm. you know. Um, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious about the connotation it could actually have. So that, that's just by way of right. just, just about the word. Just, the first thing is, is that the word is enormously powerful and enormously evocative and can mean different things to the sexes as well in different ways in which it's communicated. That would be my experience. In terms of, of, in terms of the type of love that we're speaking about in the relationship between the human person and God, before we even ask that question, there's a there's a there's a question before that, which is, am I, which is my own conviction in being loved by God. Mm. So everything has to come back to this this, this receptivity and surrender and mm. openness to being yes. loved by yeah. God. And then, then I think once once that once your life is based with that as the center, um, then really the the love we're speaking about is. You know, it's it's mirrored both in you know, I mean Jesus mirrors it for us. Like he speaks about Abba the Father, 
Uh, so he speaks that we're all children of God. So, so I think the closest analogy to it then is that we actually are children of a loving Father. We're children of a loving God. And, and really, we're completely dependent on God. We're, de we're dependent on God, you know, and even for our breath, for the ability mm. to even breathe. So it's really, it's really a relationship of, of very healthy dependency. And I think that the closest human mirroring of it on one level is the relationship between a child and a parent. The other mirroring of it then is the relationship between a man and a wife in marriage uh, in terms of its permanence, its fidelity, its solidity, its utter commitment, its, its recognition of mutual support and, 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 um, and affection. Uh, um, so, so in other words, to, to, to answer your question slightly differently, if I was to say that my wife and I, we are best friends, we are best friends, but that doesn't capture the, the fullness of the marriage. Mm. Uh, and to say in my relationship with God is one of friendship, it doesn't capture the fullness of the relationship. And ultimately, as you reflect on it more, nothing can actually capture the fullness mm -hmm. of the relationship because we're speaking about our surrender to an infinite love. Um, so these are only analogies that we can actually speak of. Yeah, I, I, no, I think you're right. I, I, that was actually a, a really genuine question on my part. And part, it's partly provoked by conversation in the gospel between Christ and Peter on the seashore mm. when I think probably with if I'm not reading if this isn't eyes of Jesus if I'm not reading it in the text where Jesus with a sort of part of mischievous gleam in his eye is basically twitting uh, Peter about the triple denial mm. <laughs> okay mm. and he says Peter do you love me mm. uh, Peter says yes and then he says again well do you love me and Peter says well yes and then he says yes but do you love me Mm. And Peter says, look, <laughs> you know God, that I love you, right? Mm. But what's interesting is that in the Greek, they use a different word, right? So when Jesus asks him the first time, he says, do you? And he uses a form of the word agape, mm. which is like caritas, mm. the disinterested desire for the good of another. Peter responds with the Greek word philine, which is a different form of love, right? Mm. And the second time this, is quest this question and answer goes on, it's the same. It's agape from Christ and it's philine from Peter. But the third time, I don't know what the significance of this, mm. if any. Maybe I'm reading it into the text. Mm. Jesus says, do you fill line me? Mm. And Peter responds, Lord, you know I fill line. Mm. Right? He, use, he uses the same word, right? Not if you like above and below, but if you like on mm. the same level. And mm. I found that very significant. I'm not sure if that just clouds the, the, clouds the, um, the water or helps, but yeah. But, you see, but, but of course, the other aspect is to fill out your, the question more. I mean, we're speaking here about a relationship with each of the three persons of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. So the relationship with the Father has mm -hmm. the analogy of the parent-child relationship. But the relationship with Jesus has the very third quality that you're speaking about there, mm -hmm. you know, between Jesus and Peter. Like, this is an, a really intimate friendship. Friendship, and a yeah, real friendship, friends, yeah. You know? And then the, the relationship with the Holy Spirit. It's interesting, like, after that triple questioning of Peter and the triple affirmation, Jesus then goes on to say to Peter, I'm going to bring you places that you do not want to go. You know? <laughs> yeah. In other words, that the spirit yeah. that comes from Christ brings us into places that we don't anticipate, we don't plan, we don't expect, and we mightn't even want to go. God, absolutely. And actually, but at the same time, we know with an underlying conviction that this is where our happiness truly is, where our real sense of purpose and significance and joy actually is in life. Mm -hmm. But can I just say something to you just about yeah. love too, about the nature of love? You see, love for me is something which you know by its fruit, by, <laughs> its, by its effect, yeah. you know? Um, there's a, and of course, you'd, you'd learn all these things living in a family too, but, but a, a simple thing which Linda and I joke about recently, it's like when the phone rings in your home and you're, you're reading a book or you're sitting down and you're, one of your kids comes in or your wife comes in and they say, X is on the phone. Now, when you hear X is on the phone, do you have a sense of interior joy? You get up, I want to speak to him or her. Or do you have a sense of... Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. You see, and that's, that's the point about the giving and the receiving of love, that it's known by the fruit of joy and enthusiasm and happiness. And, and that's really, you, you, know, you, you know it when you see it. But, but what I, something that intrigues me more and more now, I suppose, is that 
it's about heartfelt knowledge. It's about living from the level of the heart. And the heart is expanded through the experience of love. And you know, the, the, the head is expanded through the experience of study and reflection, but the heart grows through love, through the, mm. through the receiving and giving of love. And, um, and it's, known by the, it's known by the experience of joy. That's <coughs> really where, where, where you know whether you're experiencing love or not. I mean, it's really a question, am I enjoying life? You see, you see what's very interesting too, mm. I think, when we talk about these different models of Catholicism, you see, God, we're made to enjoy life. Yes. Know. We're made to enjoy life. We're not made to be miserable. <laughs> and, <laughs> and we're also not made to be weighed down with, yes. yeah. with the burdens of life. And again, you see, I think this is an important aspect of, of Pope Francis, that I think that that is coming through very strongly in this pontificate, that, you know, I mean, nobody can question his, his enormous commitment to the poor, and his enormous commitment to the marginalized and his commitment to the environment. But there is a playfulness and a gleefulness and a joy and a humor as well about how he relates to people. And I like that enormously because that to me is, it's, it's an indicator of something very good with him, of, of, of knowing oneself as loved and wanting to be that love to others. Patrick, I want to, in fact, there's so much I want to pick up on and I do want to come back if, I, if we have time before we finish to talk about the uh, social and political implications of some of the things we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. But before that, I do want to turn to the, your, the your domestic mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. center, mm -hmm. um, which you've called Integritas, mm -hmm. which obviously is Latin for integrity and wholeness mm -hmm. bringing together it. And it's, I mean, uh, rather than sort of reading out here, and this is, there are four dimensions to this as I see it and so mm -hmm. on, but maybe you could sort of, Again, you've given us some idea of why you've started this up, but maybe you could say a little bit more and then maybe mm. expand on the different dimensions of it. Of course, yeah. yeah. So I, I think a core image that was very important to me um, in, in my 20s when I was kind of going through this mm. crisis is uh, an image we'd all remember from school, which is where you put magnetic filings on a page and you put a magnet underneath the page. It, yeah, yeah. And when you put the magnet underneath the page, all the filings yeah. develop an integrity or a coherence. So in other words, there has to be this magnetic attraction at the center, which is not actually visible because it's underneath mm -hmm. the page. But everything above, all the filings come into an integrity. So there's a line in, in uh, John's uh, Gospel again, and it's where Jesus says, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people unto myself. So. This is very central, or to me, the absolute central, really, of the Christian experience, that the incomparable beauty of the death and resurrection of Christ at the center draws all to himself and in turn all to the Father. So the, the beauty, the radiance, uh, the greatness of Christ's death and resurrection is the magnet that draws all to itself. So what do we mean by drawing all? What we mean is is it's, it comes back again to relationality and to relationships, that there are certain key relationships in one's life that develop an integrity or an integritus. Once there's a recognition of Christ as being the center of one's life. And those relationships are essentially four. There's four key relationships. And the first relationship is the relationship with God. You know, the, re, you know, the relationship with God through, through prayer and through discernment of your mm -hmm. vocation. The second relationship is the relationship with your own nature and with human nature, that you're a created being. You, you have a given nature which you cannot, as Pope Benedict mm -hmm. says, you cannot manipulate at will. You've got to accept the nature you have been given, honor it, respect it, and act in accordance with it. And the third relationship then is your relationship with your family and with your friends and with the Christian community. And the fourth relationship is with the vulnerable or the marginalized uh, with society and with the environment and with creation. Mm. So these, these four relationships, uh, and something I believe very strongly, you're either coming alive in all four or you're not coming alive in any of them. You, know, you, can't, you can't say, I'm going to have a wonderful relationship with God and I'm going <laughs> to ignore the others, or yeah. I can have a wonderful relationship with my family and I can ignore the relationship with God or my own nature or with the vulnerable and with society, with the, uh, the created order of the environment. All four come alive or none come alive. So the, the word integritus, which is just a Latin term taken, it's to describe this phenomenon of how 
when you allow yourself to be drawn, attracted to the love of Christ, the incomparable love of Christ, and integrity, the filings develop around Christ, and the filings are these four relationships, and this order develops. So, so what we do at the center in our own home is that we really focus in different ways on how these four relationships can be honored and respected. But the core thing all the time is allowing oneself to receive the love of Jesus Christ. You know, there's nothing, there's no, this is a Christian center. Um, so what, what does that mean in real terms? Mm. What do we actually yeah. do? So what yeah. we actually do is, that the first thing we do is we have prayer and reflection every Thursday night. Um, and the form of prayer we use is based on the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. So we have that every Thursday night. And on the first Thursday of every month, including tonight, we have uh, a talk as well where we, we, we reflect on the material that we're actually praying with. That's the first thing. The second thing we do then is we do study and research. Uh, so Linda, my wife, is, uh, I shouldn't say she's a full-time student. She's not a full-time student. She's a full-time doing so many things, but, but she is doing a lot of study now yeah. at the moment, in particular on Christian anthropology and education, right. uh, that we're all made in the image and likeness of God. So we do a lot of study, and I try to do study uh, as much as I can too, and we encourage other people to study, and we do different research articles and research projects. The third thing we do then are meetings and hospitality, and that's extremely important. So we, we used to have a program of courses, we did that for years. Now we have a, meetings to a lesser extent, but they're quite focused meetings. So for instance, we've had a number of meetings over the last three or four years on the whole issue of the protection of Catholic education. So there are more meetings which are designed to kind of help people in different fields to feel supported and to share ideas which you can bring back into the particular field that you're in. And the fourth thing we work on then is publications and advocacy. So in other words, we, we try to bring out pamphlets, booklets, uh, different documents, and do media work as well uh, to, to kind of articulate the Christian vision that we're seeking to honor, which is this integrated understanding of Christ at the center <coughs> of these four relationships. All right, um, of those four, uh, I'm going to pass over the first two lightly, not because they're important, but because to go there would, <laughs> would leave us no room. We wouldn't come back. We wouldn't come back. Yeah. I just want to focus on three and four, which are on the family and mm. then the broader, uh, mm. if, if you like, a social and physical environment, mm. right? And so this kind of moves me to where I really, to if you like, to where I said we would might go, which is what specifically, if, if anything, in those areas are matters of immediate concern to you and to the group in Integritas? What kinds of things, if you like, uh, really attract your attention? Mm. What do you see as being problematic as needing care and concern, mm. uh, particularly in relation maybe to level four yeah. uh, and so on, or the, or the inter interaction yeah. between three and four? Yeah, I mean, the, the big one, uh, which really was like a kind of a tsunami when it happened, was the marriage referendum in 2015. Mm. And that's a kind of... Marriage uh, and, and changing the definition of what marriage is is really, we're really into the area of three and four then mm. of, you know, family, friendship, Christian community and the relationship then with the vulnerable, with society and with the environment. So there's a particular concept which began under the pontificate of John Paul II. It was significantly developed by Pope Benedict and it is very significantly developed again by Pope Francis. And it's this idea of human ecology. Mm. Uh, and in particular, um, something that interests me greatly is the human ecology of the family. Um, because, you know, we see so much activism and, uh, around climate change and an awareness, a green awareness of our environment. But there's also an ecology of the human person and of how humans actually relate, which is a received nature. You know, it's not a nature mm. we can manipulate as will, again, to take that phrase of Pope Benedict. So, when the marriage referendum happened in 2015, that had a big effect on the work we were actually doing because I think, very understandably, I think a lot of people misunderstood, particularly me, nobody misunderstands my wife, a lot of people misunderstand me. Um, <laughs> but people kind of misunderstood or may have misunderstood why I was so preoccupied with that and I'm really preoccupied with that. Because, and I'm not just talking about it preoccupied by it from a theological or religious sense, I'm also talking about it as being preoccupied with it from a biological or an ecological sense. Yeah. Because 
you know, it's not just simply that we're made in the image and likeness of God, and God has made us as man and woman in the image and likeness of God, but our actual genetic biological structure comes from the union of a man and a woman. That's our genetic structure comes from our own biological mother and father. So the complementarity and the interrelatedness of man and woman is absolutely fundamental to human ecology and what human ecology is. So the, the protection of the understanding of marriage as a union between a man and a woman, I see as you know, of critical importance in protecting true human identity, the, the natural, the biological, and the spiritual identity of the human person. And the way that feeds through is that what we're, what we're finding is that when we move into the field uh, of reproduction, and I, and I make a very clear distinction here between reproduction and procreation, right? when we move into reproduction and we move into reproductive technologies, we're finding there's a complete disregard for filiation, that, that, a, that, that a person's own historical genetic identity is not actually being respected. And this feeds back to, to a disrespect for the fact that human life comes through the union of man and woman. So we're, we're, we're turning ourselves into gods, that we, we're not accepting our, the created order and our creatureliness and the need to respect immutable, inalienable, unchanging laws of nature, of natural law that must be respected. And this won't happen in our lifetime, but I have no doubt in our children's lifetime, in our grandchildren's lifetime, this disregard now, which has really taken root now, in terms of divorcing reproduction uh, from its real understanding, which is procreation. But what, what do I mean by that? I mean, do, divorcing the ability to bring new life into the world from the loving, respectful, permanent, caring union of the man and woman who bring this life into the world is tragic and has devastating consequences, which we will see in generations to come mm. when, when, when people move into adulthood who will never know who their father is, you know, who will never know who their true mother is. Uh, and this is um, this denial of the right of a child to have the love, enduring love, enduring and permanent love and affection of their own mother and father is a very serious violation of the dignity of a human person. So the, the problem really with the marriage referendum in 2015, and it was very brilliantly, the, the, the yes vote was very brilliantly managed and very yes. brilliantly conveyed, but it, 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 was, it was a debate that never actually took off in, mm. in the sense that it, it was a vote on whether you're a caring person towards people with the same sex orientation or you're not a caring person. The referendum was not about that. That yeah. wasn't actually what it was about. Mm. I mean, the referendum ultimately, the proper definition, it's called the marriage equality referendum. What it actually, the truthful definition of it is, is the redefinition of marriage referendum. <laughs> okay. and, and the, the immutable, unchanging truth of what marriage is, is the union between man and woman. So th this, this whole um, reconstruction of what it means uh, to be a human person, of what it means uh, as to who your mother and father is, what it means to actually reproduce as a human being, this is very um, worrying. Um, because what's happening here is that we are forgetting that we have a received ecology as human, as the, the human person has a received ecology which has got to be respected and cannot be manipulated or restructured in a certain way. And there's a phrase in, in um, Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation of Morris Letizia early on in, in that text uh, and it really struck me as it just precisely explained what happened in Ireland in 2015 where it says Many countries, many countries are witnessing a legal deconstruction of the family. And the Republic of Ireland is the international leader <laughs> in the legal deconstruction of the family. family. So an issue of, of study that I really want to work on for the rest of my life, if I can, is to work on the legal reconstruction of the family based on a human ecology of rights. And this is another issue then when we talk about the fourth relationship, when we talk about the relationship with the vulnerable and with society and the environment. We have completely lost the true meaning of what human rights are. Uh, and there's mm. a huge problem with human rights. Uh, I actually call them dehumanized rights. <laughs> um, because what we've done is that we've actually taken the human out of human rights. We have, we, we need, the phrase I would use is we need a human ecology of rights. Because we have, divorced rights 
from what our actual nature is. And we lay claim to rights which are completely divorced from human nature. So to give a, an example of this, the World Health Organization in 2017 said that an individual person, a single person, has a right to reproduce a child. Now, a single person cannot naturally, on his or her own, reproduce a child. So you're conferring a right on somebody to do something which in nature they cannot do. <laughs> and that could never be a human right because it's contrary to the nature of the human person. So this is the, you know, the, the influence of post-humanism and transhumanism, which, which is a, a very prevalent uh, um, force of thinking now, which is that we are divorcing the human person from the human body and divorcing the human person from his or her nature and divorcing relationships from the complementarity of man and woman. And all of this is having consequences. So to take an example of it, in, in 2015, Facebook um, put up 56 different genders that a yes. person could be. You could choose 56. And they took that down in April 2015 because they felt it was too limiting. That's right. That you should have the ability just to write in your own gender. Like you have a right to define your own nature, but you, you don't have a right to define My it. current list r runs to about 250. Yes. <laughs> in case I presume it's growing. Mm. Well, I struggle to get beyond two. <laughs> but, yeah. um, but you see, that's interesting too, you see. That, that that's in, that there's an interesting thing there, you see, which happened in the redefinition of marriage yeah. referendum in 2015, which is that we got very, conf it's very confused about human nature. And three things got confused because you have to keep three different levels of the understanding of the human person, uh, not just apart, but you have to understand their hierarchical nature. And the first is the human person as an embodied reality, the human person in a physical body with a genetic structure, with a hormonal profile, with chromosomes. You know, that's our biological embodied nature. Yes. Then you have a person's gender, mm. which is culturally how we understand what it means to be masculine, what it means to be feminine. So the biological is the nature of a man and a woman. Then you have the cultural understanding of masculine and feminine. And then above that again, then you have sexual orientation, the, the, a person who's attracted to a person of the opposite sex, to a person of the same sex, to persons of either sex. So you've got the biological reality, the cultured gender reality, and sexual orientation. And what we did in the redefinition of marriage referendum was we said, the biological has got no place. No, yeah, Just yeah. ignore it completely. Yeah. And you then take gender and sexual orientation and you flip them upside down. Yeah. So we're going to define a person by their sexual orientation. And their gender is then fluid. You can just choose your gender, whatever you'd like it to be. And this is completely contrary to the actual truthful, unchanging nature of the human person. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I. As we were talking about these things beforehand, I mentioned that my next book is going to be, to some extent, related to these matters. And one of the central themes of that book is going to be what I call, or at least what I have called up to now, though I've been told the term has been used elsewhere in another context, so I might have to redo it, or what I've been calling uh, doctrine of radical plasticity, mm. which is that uh, our human, there is no given uh, in, in nature to, to being a human being. We are essentially a kind of formless lump, as it were, which like clay, which can be shaped into mm. any form and then, in fact, remade, knocked down again and restructured as we see fit. So that we are, uh, to use the term you used earlier, we are like gods, we are making mm. ourselves. And we are made not in the image and likeness of God, but in our own <laughs> image mm -hmm. and likeness, whatever that may be. And that's extremely worrying. I think it's incoherent. Uh, I also think it's socially damaging. Mm -hmm. And I, so I take your point about the well, consequences. Well, it's also too because the prevailing political philosophy is secularist liberalism. Yeah. In other words, that the, the greatest level of individual autonomy and the search for personal happiness are the ultimate human goals. Mm. So the, 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 the philosophy, or the political understanding that comes from Christian faith is that it is my my, my loved unconditional acceptance of, from God and from that the care of others and the care of God's creation are what are ultimate goals. Mm. So they're, they're, they're completely irreconcilable expressions of what it is to be a human person and what the nature of reality is. But ultimately what it comes down to is that 
we are completely rebelling against the fact that we are creatures, that we are created beings, uh, be because in this crazed search for greater and greater autonomy. And the irony, of course, of all of this is that it is by acceptance of God's love that we enter into true freedom. It's, the, it's, it's this thing of, of, you know, a beautiful distinction, uh, and Linda is actually working on this a lot at the moment, so this is on my mind a lot, but there's two fundamentally irreconcilable views. One is that you have to earn your worth in the world, and the other is that your worth is a given. And they're irreconcilable. And if you have to earn your worth in the world, you have to continuously strive to prove yourself, to establish yourself, to form yourself. The other is a completely different view, which is uh, which issues in a sense of joy and gratitude all the time, which is that you are so gifted in what you, in who you are, in what you are, in what you've been given, and really it's a question in joy and in gratitude to try and use those gifts as best you can throughout your life, uh, and they're they're very very different perspectives. And what's important about them, I think, in the field of education. Yeah, I wanted to come yes, to that. Yeah. Is, is, you know, the importance of translating this and expressing this to young people, particularly people in secondary school, that they are so uh, colonized with the, the, the overwhelming uh, commercial sense that they are not fine the way they are, that you have to buy something, you have to acquire something, you have to earn something to become who you truly want to be instead of a completely different uh, perspective, which is that you're made in the image and likeness of God, you're loved eternally by God, uh, and everything in your life is a given, uh, and is an enormous gift uh, in your life. You know? So it's a sense, it's a different thing entirely. It's, an, it's, a, it's, it's a whole approach of appreciation, and also a sense of developing an unhurried sense. You know, the thing mm -hmm. that, you know, there was a, a, a great friend of mine um, Father Desmond O'Donnell, and he used to say to me, you know, when I was getting worried about things, he'd say to me, Fa he said to me, Patrick, uh, let God get the ulcer, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, like it's all, it's all well, and it's all going to be well, yeah. and, you know, that's... Yeah, a, I've a worked in the presupposition that there's no tomorrow, mm. which is actually a very effective way to get things done. Mm. <laughs> so please mm. do it now. But no, I take your point about the, the givenness and, and, uh, and the, the two different views, if you like. Um, but I want to maybe finish our conversation today by talking about the broader aspects of education, especially education as it now functions in relation to what is the secular ideology in our society, mm. and what you think about that, um, it, if it presents dangers, and if yes. so, what those are. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, that's a really important question. I mean, I think what, what, what we need to be really clear about is, is that it's, there's a real absence of free thinking in our society. Um, and again, this is a phrase that, that comes from Pope Francis. We're ideologically colonized. Uh, and in my view of all Western societies, there is no country as ideologically colonized as the Republic of Ireland. We are the leitmotif on this. World so leaders. World leaders. So what, does, what, do I, what do I mean by ideological colonization? And it really means three things. It means, firstly, a society is ideologically colonized if everyone thinks the same way, if everyone speaks the same way, or if somebody speaks in a different way, they are absolutely vilified. So really, when you look at our parliament, you look at our national newspapers, you look at our broadcasters, they're all really saying the same thing. And more importantly, if somebody says something different, they're hammered. So that's the, the mm. first thing is, is thinking the same way. The second aspect of it then is the erasure of memory. Because so I always think of Brian Friel's play translations mm. in relation to this, that you know, we have 16, 15 to 1600 years of a Christian heritage. That's all been, like the memory of that is all being erased, completely erased uh, by the extraordinary virulent level of anti-Catholicism that exists in this country at the moment. An anti-Catholicism which, in my view, is stronger in this country than in any other Western country at the moment. Mm. So that's the second thing. So we're all thinking the one way, and then our memory, our 15 to 1600 years of our Christian heritage is erased. And the third aspect of ideological colonization then is to get control of the schools. Ah, right. And that's where the education, because that's where the whole matrix is put together, it's to get control of schools. So if you get control of schools, you stop critical thinking, you stop different ways of thinking, 
and you also stop teaching children the history and the memory. Mm. So the control of the schools is the cap or the lid or the link that brings about ideological colonization. Now, this phrase ideological colonization, this is used by Pope Francis in the context of how different aid agencies and, and supposed human rights bodies will give uh, finance to developing countries on the basis that they will subscribe to a particular form of health care or medical care yeah. or, or an expression of reproductive rights, for instance. Um, so what he's saying is that you impose on a particular culture and a particular tradition a particular Western value and you give the finance for that so they become ideologically colonized. But what I'm more interested in is the same idea of ideological colonization, but it's how a country allows itself to become colonized. You know, we've, we've allowed this to happen ourselves mm. in that we allow only one, one type of thinking. Uh, I mean, for instance, even this, you know, this series of conversations you have, like it is inconceivable that Jared Casey would be asked to actually put together a series of interviews for any type of national broadcaster. It just would not happen, <laughs> like in this country. It's just not going to happen, yeah. you know? So, um, and then, you, you know, our whole memory, our whole Christian identity, our Christian heritage, like that is so, being so forgotten in this mm. tsunami of a Catholic uh, dislike and, and, um, and upset and antagonism that we actually live in. So that's why the schools are so important to actually break the grip of this. But there's something else about um, ideological colonization I want to say just something about as well. And it's what I call internal colonization. And what I mean by internal colonization, it's when our own leaders in the Catholic Church are afraid to mm. actually articulate the basic tenets of Catholic doctrine. And this is really prevalent at the moment. Now it's understandable in uh, an Irish context because we're living in such a virulent time to be Catholic, such a difficult time to be Catholic. It's understandable that people in positions of leadership in the Catholic Church feel afraid or feel quietened or feel beaten down. I understand that. But the, it's, it's when other people speak up who are Catholics and they're kind of mocked or ridiculed by their own leaders in yes. the Catholic Church. That I find very hard to take. That is hard to take. You know? And again, you see, what's, you know, we saw this, uh, you know, uh, this was quite re very relevant really at the World Meeting of Families in 2018 in Dublin, is that when you read all of what Pope Francis writes, like if you read all of the document of Amoris Letizia, for instance, I find it a beautiful expression of the Catholic, Christian Catholic understanding of marriage and the family. But you can't just select certain bits that are non-controversial or that don't say something to the current and prevailing culture. You've got to, you've got to articulate the whole message. So what's interesting mm. is, is that the World Meeting of Families, which was in Dublin in 2018, that's going to be in Rome in 2021 uh, between the 24th and the 27th of June. <laughs> and it'll be very interesting yeah. to compare the focus of the World Meeting in Dublin with the focus of the world meeting in Rome. And my guess is they're going to be radically different oh, really? in terms okay. of their focus. Could I say, I mean, just on, your, on the second point there, when you were teasing out the elements of ideological colonization uh, and you spoke about the erasure of memory, I'm really struck by what happened in 2000 when we decided to put up a structure to celebrate the year 2000, which is nominally 2000 years of Christianity. Mm. And so two things. One, it didn't occur in the year 2000, which is striking. And B, when it did go up, it consisted of a, a spike mm. or a spire, mm. which I mean, you could take, you know, was, was it the cross? Was it, was it, was it in other words, is there anything about that particular uh, structure to tell you what it was about and the answer mm. is absolutely none in mm. fact it would have been better not to have done anything mm. because at least it wouldn't be there but you have this <laughs> finger sticking up mm. in the middle of Dublin and you go what is that mm. it, it it's really Which none of us even notice anymore of course yeah. too you know it's just it's so meaningless yeah. and bland yeah. that it has nothing to say to us like yeah. nothing to say you know but your point about the internalization of this kind of ideological colonization is really worrying. And mm. I've, I experienced some of this even 20 years ago. So this is not a recent problem. Mm. This has been going on for, 
for quite a while. And indeed, this is a standard practice of all colonizing powers because it was done politically. Uh, when you invaded another country and you wanted to take it over, uh, it costs money to run an army and police and so forth. So the best thing you can do actually is to co-opt the local leaders Mm. Okay, and bring them into your circle and, you know, and make them, as it were, say, you're one of us now, and then get them to do the controlling. Mm. That's a whole lot cheaper and more effective mm. and so on. So in a way, this is a tried and tested technique for, for controlling populations. Mm. And in, so we see this on all sorts of levels, on the political and indeed on the religious. So it's, it's distressing, but it's not surprising and it's alarmingly effective. Well, the other thing just about, you know, your vocation, your life, you see, what, what is really alarming about it is the colonization of universities mm. and the colonization of the humanities and the colonization of academia. Because, I mean, if we can't have varied and free critical thinking in universities, where are we? <laughs> and, yes, exactly. And, and I mean, that's a major problem now in, is, all, in all Western campuses. It, it is a shocker. I wrote a little bit about this in my the book I published back in October of, of this year, I was going to say last year, uh, and so on, which is on free speech and uh, tolerance and so on. So I did, I'm, I haven't been in the university system for 35, 40 years, I'm actually aware of this, mm. and it is very distressing, somebody of my way of thinking. We've talked about a lot. There's a lot more to talk about, but we're not going to do it today. Mm. Patrick Tracy, thank you for being thank my guest. Lovely to be here. Thank, thank you, you so George. Much. Thank you.